This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Leon Wieseltier, who is the literary editor of The New Republic. Leon, welcome to Berkeley. Pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? Brooklyn, New York, deepest, darkest, 1952. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, in many ways, some of which I'm not prepared to talk about publicly. <laughs> uh, they, um, well, they were the central fact about my parents, the central public fact about them, not the central private fact, though it was also a central private fact, is that they came to New York in 1947 as what we now refer to as survivors of the Holocaust. So I was raised in a, in a small pocket of Polish Jewish survivors uh, in South Brooklyn. And that ramified in all sorts of ways. I have to say it didn't, I don't feel at all distorted by it um, or glamorized by it and I've written about it very rarely, uh, very rarely because, um, well for many reasons, but it colored certain things, yeah. And, and it must as a young person made you very aware of history and the costs uh, of history, yeah. Acutely, phenomenally, precociously aware that everything happened on this larger canvas. I mean, the, one of the central events of the modern world ran right through my living room when I was a boy. So there was always this feeling that things were being played out, uh, both small but large also. Yeah. And, and did this lead to a discussion uh, of public issues and and yeah I'd say it did yeah. I'd say it did yeah my parents were um, you know the newspapers were on the table every day uh, I my first political memory was on my way home I must have been four uh, on my way home from the yeshiva of Eastern Parkway and had to pause while President Eisenhower drove by to throw out the first ball at Ebbets Field <laughs> and then a few years later, I went to see John Kennedy campaign outside a once famous restaurant at a place called King's Highway in mm -hmm. Brooklyn. Um, yeah, there was, and of course, we lived mentally and emotionally and historically, not just in the United States, but in Israel as well. So there was always this consciousness of the, Europe, the immediate European past and then the American present and the Israeli Middle Eastern present. There was a... So yes, our kitchen was, um, the kitchen was rather a global place. Did, did you have a good Jewish education? I had a very fine Jewish education. And, yes. and that? I went to a very uh, distinguished Jewish day school, a Zionist yeshiva sort of place, where um, I was instructed by real scholars and genuine Hebraists. Uh, I had a very, very fine Jewish education. Uh, and then your undergraduate work was Columbia, Columbia, Columbia. College. And and there you you really were exposed to an array. Uh, of I had the richest education in the history of Columbia. I think. I mean, I was uh, I was obnoxiously unappeasable about it too. But I I studied philosophy and I studied art history, and I studied English. Um, and but I had you know I was born. If I'd been born five years later, I would have missed many of my teachers. I was very fortunate. Uh, Lionel Trilling and Meyer Shapiro kind of took me in. Uh, Paul Christeller taught me the history of philosophy. I mean, there were younger, remarkable instructors, too, but, but I, had, I, I was able to sit at the feet of some great men and then continue doing that later in my education. I was very fortunate. And, and this was a, a time when uh, Columbia really introduced the Western civilization 
courses. No, and no, it was they were already they were already they going. Were they were going. Yes, CC Contemporary Civilization and what we called humanities, what they now call lit hum. They were still there, I mean, they were already there, and they provided the foundation of most of what I know. I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, they were extraordinary. If I could take them again, I would. And then you went on to Oxford. Then I went to Oxford to Balliol College, where I studied philosophy, but didn't complete a degree there because the philosophy that was being taught at Oxford in those years that was in transports of logic and philosophy of language, philosophy of mathematics. I have neither the aptitude for that nor the interest in it, um, but was had the great good fortune to be taken in by Isaiah Berlin, who um, became, uh, towards whom I had filial feelings, and we became very close for many decades, and he had an enormous impact upon my mind. And, and then back to Harvard? Then I went to Harvard to do a PhD in Jewish history and religion. I'd always intended to do advanced work in the history of Judaism. Uh, and there were some very fine younger scholars, younger, I mean, in their 40s and 50s at, uh, at Harvard. And I was a graduate student there for three years. And then at the end of my third year, was elected to something called the Society of Fellows at Harvard, which freed me, or ostensibly was, de was designed to free me from my PhD work, though I continued some of that, and, uh, and then wrote, I, when I was at Oxford, I was poor as a church mouse and began writing for places like the New York Review of Books and the Times Literary Supplement, and, and then when I came back to, to Harvard, to the States, to Harvard, I continued doing this, so I'd always had one foot in scholarship and one foot in journalism, which I've kind of reproduced only on the other side now. And um, and then wrote a little, got involved in the nuclear debate. Wrote a little book about nuclear weapons that found a great many readers, and a lot. And never completed the scholarly book I was going to write, that I planned to write about the interpretation of catastrophe in France, in the French and German Jewish communities, in the aftermath of the Crusades. But some of that material, and certainly some of the thoughts about that material, eventually made its way into Kaddish. Into mm -hmm. And right. we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to, yeah. uh, uh, in in looking at your very rich uh, education, uh, I, I gather two individuals stand out, Trilling and, and Berlin, or maybe more. There but, more. But, I mean, but, I but, was, again, I was very lucky. I mean, Trilling had enormous impact on me. Berlin did, uh, Maya Shapiro, the art historian, did. Uh, absolutely extraordinary individual. Um, taught me how to look mm -hmm. in some ways. And, and is there uh, uh, a perspective that emerged from these individuals? I mean, I get the sense that, as a result, you became a liberal in a, in a traditional yeah, sense. That's a big question. I guess I'd have to say the following. Many things emerged. At one level, what emerged was a lifelong devotion to the humanities and a great resistance to scientism, either in its social scientific or natural scientific form, and a great skepticism about scientific answers to non-scientific questions. Um, I also came to believe as a consequence of not so much anything that was directly imparted to me, but as a consequence of the weather around these people, that um, I became a kind of pluralist about human life. People live in many realms, and one must be careful not to import categories from one realm into a realm where they don't belong, because that's how misunderstandings begin. They left me with a very powerful sense of the difference between politics and culture and of the dangers of synchronizing politics with culture, or worse, culture with politics. Um, they did leave me a liberal, but a certain kind of liberal. Mm -hmm. They were all um, very distinguished anti-Stalinist liberals. Um, they were people who, I mean, Diana Trilling had an important impact on me in this particular aspect because by example, and through many hours of conversation, when I was uh, young and not very well read and rather heady, a uh, student at Columbia, she actually showed me what it was to be anti-Stalin and anti-McCarthy at the mm -hmm. same time. And I've always taken that as a model because there's never just one threat and there's never just one enemy and there's never just one danger. And you have to operate on many fronts at different levels at the same time. And so they were liberals but of a very muscular sort. They were not uh, radicals, they were not progressives. I call myself a liberal, I do not call myself a progressive. Mm -hmm. And my progressive friends certainly don't call me a progressive. 
um, yeah, so they, they, they influenced me in many ways. And, and a, an important dimension of the, the latter point is the, what, what you wound up rejecting and they rejected was that there was one totalistic view of the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what you mean by, oh, I can be against McCarthy, right. uh, but not Stalin. Everything and, is not, well, the idea that everything you, is one thing in the modern period basically derives from Hegel. Mm -hmm. that, ev that, one, that, that a single spirit animates all the manifestations mm -hmm. of human culture, all of, all of human expression. This, it, I was taught, and as I began to th read and think, became clear to me, was a, was a, a colossal and very consequential error. Uh, but having said that, they did also leave me with a deep belief in reason, not a shallow kind of rationalism that believes that the world is itself rational, but a much more sober sort of rationalism, according to which it is precisely because the world is not a rational place that reason is not only possible but necessary. Um, they were sort of, you know, a lot of my teachers, Trilling, Shapiro, Berlin, and uh, like certain other great figures in the modern world, Freud and Mann and others, they were rationalists who were f deeply interested in the exploration of the non-rational because they recognized what an important part of reality non-reason is. Um, and so it wasn't, the, it wasn't rationalism as a bubble. It was rationalism as a, a struggle, as a mm -hmm. really romantic struggle to try to expand the realm, expand the boundaries of reason in human life. One of the ideas that emerges in your writing and especially in your columns in The New Republic is the extent to which a, a totalist view often winds up not relating to reality. And, and you, it's very important, I gather, for you that the ideas, you struggle with ideas to form them, but also they, they have to be juxtaposition to yeah, reality. Yeah, I think that, you know, I don't call myself, I mean, I'm in some ways a scholar, in some ways a journalist, but it, when asked to, as they say, self-describe, the word I always use very proudly is intellectual. And what mm -hmm. I mean by intellectual is somebody who is, competent with and fluent with the theoretical dimensions of ideas, who genuinely cares about them, but also insists upon taking them to the world and into battle. Um, you know, there are certain people, conservatives used to have this slogan based on a book that was written in the 1940s. They used to say, ideas have consequences. Now, that's true, but it occurred to me many years ago, I noticed that many of the people who say that were usually more interested in the consequences than in the ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that one has to do both. Um, one has to do both. One has to be genuinely committed to the rigorous study of ideas, almost as if they had no application in the world. And then one has to take them to the world. Now, of course, not all ideas. There are some ideas that have no bearing upon various issues of the day. And, um, you know, and and not every not everything is political in fact one of the main lessons i learned from my education was to be very very strict about policing the boundaries of the political not to let everything be politicized uh and you know a poem is a poem a poem is not a political program and as an editor i'm very careful when pieces come in to be sure that i edit various kinds of pieces in ways that are appropriate to them um mm. a poem does not need to have an argument a poem does not need to be even completely clear. Uh, but if you're trying to persuade people to vote for someone or to support a treaty or to support a war or not to support a war, you damn well better be clear and have arguments and take the arguments to the other side. Mm -hmm. As an intellectual, I, I get the sense you talk often about patience. Basin, the, the patience of and the hard work that, that patience goes with, is, with patience is well it, you know it, it's certainly one of the intel, the intellectuals most difficult virtues but with, the patience is a difficult virtue every, everywhere almost but yes I mean you know the 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 impatient liberal becomes a radical I mean radical is was a kind of liberal impatience mm -hmm. um, and if people who become impatient with reform and for perfectly understandable reasons uh, begin to fantasize or to plan revolution. And the question of patience has to do with the difference between reform and revolution. Um, and it's a tricky question. It, it, it does not have an easy answer. There are certain 
questions of first principle about which a genuine revolutionary attitude would seem perfectly justified. Um, I always, the great debate I've had in my head with myself for decades, the test case for me is 19th century America is what sort of abolitionist would I have been? Would I have been a radical abolitionist or a moderate abolitionist? And the radical abolitionists were calling for war. And would I have called for war? I'm not sure. On the other hand, war did come mm -hmm. as a consequence in part of that very issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would I have been a moderate abolitionist because actually I did not, I would not have wanted to sacrifice the entirety of the American Union to the question, to the issue of slavery. I'd like to think that my loyalty to the Union would have been that great, but the evil of slavery was also so spectacular. And this is something I go round and round. Mm -hmm. There are certain questions, it, the answers are not that obvious. Mm -hmm. They're not that obvious. So, but so I try to err on, uh, in, the in the direction of patience. So, so is it, would it for what, what, what is your view of Lincoln then? Is, is, was he an ideal, political leader for mediating the, these problems? Yeah, Lincoln was a very cunning political figure who um, who didn't get into it to end slavery, but intended to end slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and navigated this. Yes, it this, was hard. I, yeah, mean, yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, it was, um, I mean, what would one's view of John Brown have been? He was mm -hmm. a terrorist, mm -hmm. out and out, killed innocent people in Kansas, killed them because he thought slavery mm -hmm. was evil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good, good end, bad means type situation. But those are, you know, and I'd like to think that I would have denounced John Brown. On the other hand, I'd like to think I would not have denounced John Brown in the way that some people denounce John, John Brown out of a certain degree of complacency or willingness to accept this, this, this evil situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you say the E word, when you, when you talk about evil, um, it triggers a certain urgency in the discussion, obviously. And it's hard to be patient with evil, and probably one should not be patient mm -hmm. with evil. But one has to be clear about what evil is, and one has to think very carefully about how one intends to combat it. Uh, but the minute you find yourself in the in fighting what you what you regard as evil, patience becomes very difficult and not necessarily a virtue. Mm -hmm. So these are not easy matters. I don't have a. I don't have a formula for them. We'll pick up this uh, thought in a minute, but I, but I want to go back to your formative experience mm -hmm. because one part of your formative <clears throat> experience comes later in your life with the writing of, of the book Kaddish, mm -hmm. which uh, 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 tell us about what your goal was there oh. in writing that book. Your father has passed away, and, and you assume the responsibility of saying Kaddish for him for a year. The immediate goal was, as uh, look, I, I was raised as an Orthodox Jew, but I did not live as an Orthodox Jew for many, many years. But even when I was not living in that way, I knew that when the time would come to uh, do my duty uh, as a mourner, I would do it because it's what my father expected of me his whole life. And it was not a question. I mean, it was so I began to do it. And when I began to do it, to do it means to appear in synagogues three times a day to utter this prayer that says nothing about mourning or death or pain. It's just, uh, it just is a series of praises of God, um, what they call a doxology. And um, I began to do it, and I began to understand that I didn't know quite what I was doing. And I decided I wanted to find out what I was doing, even though I intended to do it anyway. Um, you know, and this is true, by the way, this was not as, this is a melodramatic example, but in fact, it's usually the case in life that we are already doing the actions for which we are seeking reasons. I mean, there is no time out mm -hmm. that allows one to figure out the reasons for what one intends to do and plan how one intends to live and then proceed and act on this very well-reasoned plan. Mm -hmm. That's not what life is like. You find yourself performing certain practices, living according to certain customs, religious, secular, I mean, all kinds, and you begin to seek reasons for them. And if you don't find reasons, some of them you reject and you stop practicing, though some of them you have a, an attachment to for non-rational reasons. You have a love for them. You believe they have a, a positive practical utility. And so your failure to find a reason for them doesn't yet dissuade you from practicing them. And you keep looking 
for the reasons, and others you find reasons for, and it all works out in that way. Um, I mean, the whole relationship of belief to action works out neatly that way. Um, in this case, I s actually set out to find out what this prayer was, what this custom was, and so on. And not surprisingly, um, it turned into an investigation of some primary questions about human existence. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I'm a very bookish man, and whenever I don't, uh, whenever I'm perplexed or in trouble, my my tendency is to go to the bookshelf. Uh, and I began to go to my bookshelf, which I have a very considerable Jewish library to find medieval and ancient texts, to translate them into English just for my own pleasure. Uh, it wasn't until five or six months into this 12-month period that I even knew that I was writing a book. Mm -hmm. I was doing this to make sense of it for me, and if something came out of it, to be useful to other people. And then about five or six months into it, I realized that I was writing a scholarly work about the origins of this Jewish custom of mourning, a philosophical work about death and mortality, and a kind of spiritual journal. And I began, and, and the genres became all mixed up. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing it, I had some anxieties about that. I was like, well, what is it? And then as writers discover, when they're writing something that has some inner necessity, that was the key thing for me. It's a key thing for me about any book or movie, that it has some inner necessity. When something has this inner necessity, the questions of the genres, all those external questions fall away. It is mm -hmm. what it is. And um, I wrote it in, well, the first couple of months after my father's death, I was both, I was smashed up emotionally and I was um, living this somnambulistic life, getting up at these ungodly hours to get to shul and so on. So I wrote it in about 10 months and then permitted myself the other two months of the 12-month period after the period was done to kind of clean it up. And But it is it was written in real time. Um, it was written in real time. And, um, and at the very last minute, I cut out about 40 or 50 pages about my father and myself because I didn't want the book to be mistaken for another melodramatic confessional about a, boy, a man and his dad. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a psychological book. I don't have much interest in psychology. So, so, so really, you were practicing the work of being a scholar and an intellectual as part of a responsibility yeah. that dictated by your faith and your, your relationship to your father. Yeah, I have always believed that study is a primary spiritual expression. Mm -hmm. And in the Jewish tradition, it certainly is that. And it was always my primary religious expression because, as I say, in terms of behavior, I was lapsed and I was always very bad at prayer for a whole variety of philosophical reasons. Um, so study was was my my path, as it were, and it was also what was temperamentally suited for me. So yeah, I was um, I was a mourner, scholar, thinker, uh, diarist. I was that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you write that what you l learned, and I'm not saying this is the only thing you learned. Mm -hmm. That scripture and study were the original ca occasion. For Kaddish, not mourning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just as a his purely historical matter, mm -hmm. the Kaddish originated in the Talmudical academies in the Middle East, uh, in what is now Iraq, uh, in the early medieval centuries. And they are, the Kaddish, as I said, is just, it's a series of uh, praises of God. And it's in Aramaic. And these, this, 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 this passage was used as a kind of structural unit to separate various aspects of the prayer and to conclude study. So at the end of the early, the earliest Kaddish we have, at the end of any study of Torah or Talmud, there would be this prayer. Now that particular Kaddish actually refers to students and the students of students and teachers and, and it's quite clear that that is a kind of peroration after study. Mm -hmm. A shorter version of it became adapted to the liturgy just as a as, as a structural unit just as a kind of you know as a, as the as the ginger in the sushi between the bites <laughs> and um, and one of those structural units then was adapted for the purposes of mourning and that was the riddle for me is why why mm -hmm. and that's what I set out to 
figure out where, where and when it originated, which I'm pre pretty satisfied I, I, I discovered, and then what it meant, and mm -hmm. then what it meant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, what it meant involved getting into uh, many, many sources about the relationship of parents to children. Uh, and the whole question of filial duty and parental responsibility and so on. How did this exercise uh, affect you in your later life? I mean, did, did it prove something to you about uh, what you wanted to do thereafter? Uh, no, I have to say, um, you know, the, the when the book appeared, I mean, it was it was its reception was deeply satisfying and somewhat surprising because and it was nominated for a, a it was nominated yeah. for all kinds of things it won things that stuff doesn't interest me but um but uh but it but the certain things were said uh there was a certain traditional jewish response to it that basically portrayed me as the prodigal son who'd come back mm -hmm. and my response to that was always look i actually i never really left as you think i did and i'm not mm -hmm. quite as back as you think i am <laughs> Um, then there were those who who thought that it represented some transformation in me. That was incorrect. In fact, Harold Bloom, in a very favorable review of the book, though not a very penetrating one, um, he complained that the protagonist of this book, the hero, didn't change, didn't undergo any transformation mm -hmm. in the way that heroes are supposed to. And he was right. I didn't. Um, I have to say, I, uh, you know, it's taken me, it took me decades, but after much study and much thought, I arrived at a, what I regarded as a defensible picture of the world. And um, before my father died, I knew that parents die. Um, before I, I, you know, before I saw death, I knew that death existed. Um, if you're a student of philosophy, you've been studying these questions long before you've had occasion to experience them. So no, this was more, it turned out to be, and for this I was grateful, it turned out to be an opportunity for me to record some of my understandings of these questions, but it, my, my life was not changed mm -hmm. in that way. Um, my but life, was there a catharsis? There was, uh, there was a catharsis, certainly, but the, cathar the catharsis was in, the, I mean, the, 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 there was the, filial catharsis, the personal catharsis, which came in the form of mourning. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I mean, life was suspended in some way for a year. Uh, at first, completely suspended, then as the year wears on, increasingly less and less suspended, but still, the mourner is in Jewish law kind of pariah. It does not participate completely in the, so in the society, in the community. And it was a catharsis in that I had managed to produce what I regarded as, uh, as a, a, a satisfactory representation of my views of certain things and to write a certain kind of book. I mean, I have to say, you know, I earn my living as a certain kind of journalist. I'm not, intellectually, I'm not primarily a journalist. I've never reported on anything. I don't regard the telephone as an instrument of research. Um, <laughs> never have. Uh, I'm not that, so I'm not, um, I'm not that sort of journalist. But you are a diarist, that's what well, you're Well, yeah, my and diarist, but my diarist is, uh, it's a kind of feuilleton, it's a, it's a kind of old-fashioned late 19th, you know, 19th century, early 20th century European page in which one writes about anything one wants mm -hmm. to write about, but in which one writes about them with some learning and a certain amount of philosophical resonance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I read the polls about the election, but I'm not going to write about them. Mm -hmm. I and mean, everybody else is. You, you've written about uh, Jewish illiteracy as a, as a cultural problem for the, the, the Jews in the United States. Uh, you were not illiterate. You were clearly steeped I, in literature. And, and that made it quite a difference. As a it, Jew, I live mainly in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. as, as a non-Jew, which I am too, I mean, there's the guy in me. Um, I live in English. I live doubly. I've always believed in living doubly or triply or quadruply. Again, I told you, I, you know, we live in many realms. Uh, people who believe that, that hum a human identity must be, must be seamlessly sewn together so that it all adds up into one brilliant and beautiful mm -hmm. package. And I, I think that's an illusion. I think it's a great simplification of life. 
so yes, I live doubly. And as a Jew, I do most of my living in Hebrew uh, with great pleasure because that's the natural, that's the natural weather for Judaism. I mean, a language is your air. And Judaism, well, Judaism had a variety of languages, but its central language is Hebrew. Uh, it doesn't happen in English. And yes, I, uh, I've written about it sometime, but what I've done is I've traveled uh, the country far and wide like a, an itinerant fire and brimstone preacher um, just castigating Jews for how little they know in this regard. Mm -hmm. do, do, what, uh, does this problem relate to Jewish attitudes toward Israel? No. That is under, understanding the politics of that country? No no. 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 Early on in Israel's history in the 50s and 60s there was a certain American Jewish enthusiasm for Israel, a certain American Jewish Zionism that, 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 that impelled people to go learn Hebrew. And there were these institutions called Ulpanim that were basically Hebrew classes taught by Israelis. And there was that mm -hmm. period, but that mm -hmm. period passed. Um, and now, of course, um, most Israelis prefer to speak English with their American Jewish brethren. And I, you know, I've thought for years that the day that Haaretz posted a daily English translation of its newspaper, it practically doomed the fate of Hebrew. In, it doomed Hebrew in the American Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Now, Israel is not why, one, why American Jews sh need Hebrew or should know Hebrew. Judaism is why they should know Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, they should know their civilization. Now, now you're, uh, you've written things about uh, the Israeli government that separates that criticism, the criticism that you make from support of Israel. Is, th is this a, a subtle distinction that escapes uh, the Jewish community? I mean, that is the notion. I think that it you escapes lots of people. Again, we get back to this question of living or thinking doubly. I think that Israel has mortal enemies and needs to defend itself ferociously. Mm -hmm. And I think that unless the Palestinians get a state, the Jewish state will not survive, and that Israel has been um, unconscionably delinquent in pursuing a solution with the Palestinians. Not just this government, some former governments too, but especially this government. And I've insisted that one has to speak both these thoughts in the same breath and think them at the same time. Uh, and that it is not the case that if if there should be a, that because there should be a two-state solution, we need not worry about the Iranian nuclear capability, and it is not the case that because the Iranians may mm -hmm. want to acquire a nuclear weapon, that the Israelis don't have to worry to, to find a solution with the Palestinians. Uh, mm -hmm. People have got to learn to do a bunch mm -hmm. of things at the same time. Now each camp ideologically in the Jewish world in the Israeli political world prefers they have their preferred threat. Um, and some of that, I say that, that's a little more cynical than I mean it to sound. They may actually sincerely have arrived at the conclusion that there is one overwhelming threat. I don't see one overwhelming threat. I see a variety of very serious threats, and they all have to be addressed. And I see nothing incompatible with a robust response to the Iranian attempt to acquire a nuclear weapon, and we can discuss what a robust response means if you want, and a robust attempt to find a way to establish the state of Palestine alongside the state of Israel. I'm an old peace now guy. Um, I've always thought that the only solution to this problem are two states. It was always the only solution. It used to be called partition. Um, it's the same idea. Both peoples have the rights to the land. Neither people can have the whole land. Both, neither people are leaving the land. Both peoples have to live in peace. The only, the only solution is to divide the land. Uh, I mean, that's since the Peel Commission proposed it in 1936. That seems to have been the old morally and practically sound mm -hmm. solution. And somehow we cannot get there. So what does a robust response to the Iranian challenge? I you? am very, um, I have dark thoughts about this subject. Not dark thoughts of the, of the sort you might think. Um, I'm not persuaded that there is any military solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that the Israelis can, have a, can provide a military solution to it. Uh, the Israelis, I think, understand that, that they can't. I don't think they any longer believe that, which explains some of Netanyahu's otherwise inexplicable behavior in the last six months. Um, and the question is, 
first, does the United States have the capability to provide a military solution to this problem? And B, would the United States be willing or should the United States be willing to do this? And one can have many answers to this. Um, the only solution to the Iranian nuclear question is democratic change in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I have no doubt about that. The problem is that the democracy clock is ticking much more slowly than the nuclear clock. Um, if there is a military strike against Iran, I imagine they can cripple the facilities for two or three years. They can set it back. I then imagine that the next morning the Iranians will start to dig more deeply into a different mountain. Mm -hmm. um, there will be no damage assessment. We won't know what we've accomplished. Um, I don't worry about uh, the response in the region in the sense that I think the Iranians would unleash Hezbollah against Israel, which would be, a, there would be another war there, and I'm not taking that lightly, though the Israeli army is kind of itching to get there, to destroy that arsenal. But I believe that any attempt by anybody to set back or destroy the Iranian nuclear program would be welcomed joyously by the Saudis and the Gulf states and Egypt and so on. Um, but so I don't really have a solution to this uh, in the sense that I, I'm increasingly not of the belief that there is a military solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've written about the Arab Spring yeah. as uh, uh, someone who, in, in looking at his principles, leans on the side of humanitarian absolutely, intervention. Yeah, absolutely. and and I want to explore that because it 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 may be a place to test this idea of having principles but relating them yeah. to reality. So yeah. I, I would be interested in in your intellectual struggle to to come to the conclusion you come well, you've been very critical of the obama administration on syria but but supportive of their action in libya absolutely i think that the arab spring is the most strategically historically important event since 1988 88 89 in europe uh, i think that the possibility of political progress and social progress in the Arab world, its ramifications are so far-reaching um, that it must be supported. Um, I think that, having said that, one must understand that democratization is a very difficult and brutal process, that it is a process, that democratization is not an event, it's an era, and you have to keep your head because it doesn't happen in a day or a week. When you liberate people, you liberate the actually existing people uh, who may merely wish to be free to return to some of their old autocratic prejudices. Um, the, the turmoil, the confusion, the, the, the relative success so far of certain Islamist forces doesn't surprise me. It worries me, of course, but it doesn't surprise me. The blame for the rise of these Islamist forces is not the democratic revolution, it's Mubarak. The dictators are responsible for the rise of the Islamists because the Islamists are all that they all that was left after the dictators gutted their society of, of all its politics. So if you worry, it, Morsi is the direct result of Mubarak, not of Tahrir Square. Um, so I think that these must be supported. I think the United States should support democratic uh, stirrings and revolts just about everywhere, mm -hmm. just about everywhere. Um, I think Obama did not support it adequately or in time in Egypt, finally came around. I think Lib the intervention in Libya was, a, was the right thing to do. Um, I think that the, our failure to intervene, and I don't mean by, by invading, but to intervene in Syria is um, an act of such stupidity and moral callousness. It reminds me of what it was like in the first two and a half years of the Bosnian genocide. It uh, took mm -hmm. Clinton two and a half years to go in and stop it. Um, mm -hmm. And by the time he stopped it, a quarter of a million people had been killed. Um, everything, everything that Obama said would happen if we intervened is happening because we didn't. Mm -hmm. Everything. It is a, now a sectarian civil war. There are jihadi elements that are arriving in Syria. It is destabilizing the region. It is spilling over into Turkey. It is spilling over into Jordan. Um, uh, it is spilling over spectacularly last week into Lebanon. Um, everything that was supposed to happen as a result of our intervention is happening because the West did nothing. We are just watching it. And mm -hmm. he intones these, these high-minded statements that are 
sound more and more cynical. Um, as far as I can tell, he has absolutely no intention. Uh, uh, Obama. 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 The moral argument for intervening seems pretty clear to me. This man is massacring his people. I mean, he's massacring children. The massacre of children it mm. has played an especially central role in the Syrian rebellion in the way that the rape of women did in Bosnia. It was sort of that extra touch of evil as an instrument, and that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that extra instrument of war. Um, but there's not only a moral argument, there's a strategic argument, which is that and the strategic stakes in Syria are much higher than they were in Libya, much higher. And the fall of the Assad regime would deliver a body blow to the Iranian, to the, to the, to the Iranian government, to the regime in Tehran. And nothing is more in the strategic interest of the United States in that region than to weaken and cripple and ultimately to see replaced the regime in Tehran. On this issue, uh, a realist might say, and I want you to yeah, respond sure. to this criticism, that, that you're not showing the patience that uh, is Obama's virtue in, in this process. But remember I said earlier that there are certain, there are certain events or certain things that, again, the patience question is complicated. Showing patience in a humanitarian emergency mm -hmm. represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the emergency. If mm -hmm. the problem is that innocent men, women, and children are being massacred, then if you don't stop it immediately, you've misunderstood the problem here. Mm -hmm. You don't take your time stopping a massacre. Again, to use the imperfect medical analogy, if you discover that you have a tumor that needs immediate dramatic treatment, mm -hmm. you don't escalate, you nuke it, um, mm -hmm. which, is what, uh, which is why people get rushed to the hospital and their lives change overnight. Because the only meaningful response, the only effective response, is an immediate response and a significant response. So I think it, when it comes to the stopping of atrocities, mm -hmm. conferences and escalation and it, it is the opposite. It, it, it is actually a way of, it, 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 it's, it's do, that form of doing something is the worst way of doing nothing. Mm -hmm. But again, if you want to talk about it from a cold-hearted, realistic perspective, just look at the map. The mm -hmm. overthrow of Assad would be devastating to Iran, devastating to Hezbollah, devastating to Russia, um, strategically, Mm -hmm. These are all goods for the mm -hmm. United States. These are all goods. Um, I don't see. I don't see that now. Is will the, the argument the realists say? But there will be chaos. To which I respond. But there is chaos. Mm -hmm. There already is chaos. And the reason there's chaos is because we've been passive. Mm -hmm. Or one of the reasons. You know, there is chaos. Mm -hmm. They say it will be an ethnic sectarian war. It is an ethnic sectarian war. It wasn't a year ago. It mm -hmm. wasn't a year ago. So I think that uh, our policy on Syria has been disastrous and, in, and, and should um, disqualify Obama from dining out on the Libyan example any further. Mm -hmm. you, you actually believe that humanitarian internationalism is, is a way, one of the great contributions of the United States. I think that American back power back can be used for good yeah. and should be used for good. Yeah. Yeah. I think the fact that it's been used for ill does not mean it can never be used for good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but again, and, and I, I believe that one has to judge each case. I supported the Iraq war because I believed, I believed what I was told, that there were weapons of mass destruction there, and more to the point because Saddam Hussein had already used them. The important fact about Saddam Hussein was Halabja, mm -hmm. was the chemical warfare against his own people. The Kurds. Yeah. The Kurds. And, but they were Iraqi Kurds. And, um, and I thought, I don't have to speculate about the willingness mm -hmm. of this man to use them. He's already shown that he can. When it became clear to me that there were no weapons of mass destruction, I recanted my support immediately. Though I did say that my feelings about the origins of the war it, it shed no light on what the outcome of the war might be, and that Iraq without Saddam Hussein, with this groping towards some sort of parliamentary open mm -hmm. system, will, will be, may turn out to be a blessing. But if I'd known there were no weapons of mass destruction, I would not have done what Bush mm -hmm. did. Afghanistan, by contrast, was a war that I thought was perfectly justified, not only so as to extirpate the people who committed the act of terror in New York and Pennsylvania and Washington against us, but also because the kind of collateral humanitarian effect of destroying the Taliban also seemed justified to me. So my problem became then that, but after 
not just 10 years now, but eight years, it became clear to me that the Afghans don't want it. They just mm. want our protection. Mm -hmm. Every time we go in, they're fine. When we move away, the, the, the Taliban come right back. We're supposed to come back in the next fighting season, clear it out. It, they'll be fine. They, they welcome us. Then the Taliban come back. Um, so I actually, th whereas the Afghan war seemed perfectly justified to me and still does, I gave up on it about a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all on a case-by-case -case thing. I do think that we do, that, that when there are what I call moral emergencies, and obviously some of this has to do with reflection on the failure of any power to come to the rescue of people like my parents during the Second World mm -hmm. War. Um, that's kind of textbook obvious, but still I think that is the, that is the paradigm. Um, when certain atrocities at a certain level take place, I think anyone with the power to stop it has a responsibility to stop it. In most cases, the United States is the one with the power to stop it, and in almost all cases, the United States is the only one that will entertain the, the argument for stopping it. So yes, um, you know, I don't think we're ever in danger of being the policemen of the world. I really don't. Because of the politics. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, people talk about, you know, in the last decade, people have talked about the United States because of Iraq and Afghanistan as an empire. Mm -hmm. The British were in India for 200 years. Mm -hmm. Right? We can't be in a place for 200 months before mm -hmm. it starts. Mm -hmm. No, we're not. That's the, I don't believe that, 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 that wild, excessive intervention is the danger. Mm -hmm. I think that American diffidence about the world, you can call it isolationism, you can call it what you want, is the danger. I think that the economic analysis of strategic realities is the danger. It's not all about money. Even if China owns whatever percentage of our treasury bills that they own, when people are in trouble, when Syrians are in trouble or Iranians are in trouble or Haitians are in trouble mm -hmm. after an earthquake or Japanese are in trouble after the uh, nuclear plant melts down, they don't go to China or Brazil. They mm -hmm. come to us, mm -hmm. and quite rightly, mm -hmm. because they know that we're the people who not only have the capacity, the capability to help them, but who will entertain the thought of helping them. Mm -hmm. We will actually consider doing this. Mm -hmm. To, to change subjects, because you wear many hats, and uh, I'm trying to touch on all of them, uh, let's talk about the changes at the New Republic and being a literary editor. Um, and, yeah. and what I have in mind here is the, the tradition that you represent mm -hmm. is really generally threatened by the commercialization of publishing, by the web, and so on. How do we navigate these these transitions and and preserve the the kinds of traditions that you're all about in in, in terms of a, a liberal literary tradition. That's a complicated question. I think that the pressures on serious thought and serious writing in America were always very great, and people who held my job, which is a distinguished little perch in American life. I mean, I sit in Edmund Wilson's chair and Malcolm Cowley's chair and Alfred Kazin's chair. and um, People like that were always complaining about Yahooism and middlebrowism and mid-cult, and there were always these pressures. And the, the advocacy and the defense of serious thought and serious writing was always a kind of embattled activity. You're right that in recent decades, it's become increasingly embattled. Um, the main threat, obviously, at the very beginning at least, seemed technological, seemed technological. And there was this um, deranged, dizzy first period in the history of the internet when um, it seemed that it would overwhelm everything. You know, I used to say that they finally invented a medium of communication with no limitations of physical space and everything had to be 400 words. <laughs> and of course, it had to do with the speed. Mm -hmm. It's all about, the technology is all about the speed. Now, that has shaken out a little bit. That has shaken out a little bit. I see this in my work. I see it everywhere. Uh, and one can make the argument, which I do sometimes and which I, one has to, that if one wishes to preserve what we recognize as an experience of serious reading, then the tablet can provide such an experience as well. Um, the web, the internet, blogging, all that stuff, um, if, it, if it had never been invented, that would have been fine with me. 
though I understand that there are doctors and scientists and dissidents who find uses for this technology and so on. But I was, you know, life was quite fast enough for me, thank you, before <laughs> all this. But the fact is that the, 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 the tablet does provide an experience of a page. Um, it's one of the things that we'll be experimenting with at the New Republic now is, um, is this. Uh, my view has been that, um, that just because there are new bottles doesn't mean that the old wine is bad. There was, as I say, in this first period of the internet dizziness, this view that if there are new bottles, we need new wine. It has to be shorter, it has to be faster, it has to be linked, it has to be hyperlinked, it has to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's, whoever wants to stay linked and hyperlinked and stay in the echo chamber can and will, and it's fine, it exists. But the, th you know, this technology now has been routinized. It's, everybody uses it at all levels of American culture, of American life. So the challenge now is to find ways to put the old bottle, the old wine in the new bottles and to keep the old wine in the old bottles. And what we're, I mean, you know, this is a little bit of a complicated a, a metaphor, but I think of what we're trying to do at my magazine now as to preserve the old wine in, in the old bottles and the new bottles. So we're, we have, a, I mean, this young man who bought the, acquired the magazine, one of the Facebook guys, is an extraordinarily thoughtful man. I mean, it's, I've gotten to know him and he's been supportive of all the magazine's strengths. And um, he's interested in what people now refer to as long form writing, but that means essays and developed arguments and serious criticism. And so my responsibility, his responsibility, our responsibility is not to mistake a technological revolution for an intellectual revolution and to use the new technology to, to, to create and proliferate the old discourse, which is still necessary. You see, I've always, look, the, there are still a large number of serious people in this country, all the distractions and temptations notwithstanding. They're there, they're there. We could quadruple our circulation mm -hmm. without having to create one new reader. We just have to find the natural readers who are there. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I'm not pessimistic. In that sense, I'm not pessimistic. What I'm more pessimistic about are, is, is whether this new wired culture of ours with its new interests and so on will continue to produce the sort of students and graduate students or young writers and thinkers mm -hmm. who will want to inherit the old discourse. I have to think it will. My greatest challenge as an editor and my greatest pleasure as an editor is in finding the heirs. Nothing mm -hmm. gives me greater pleasure than to find the heirs. I find them. I look hard, I find them. They're good. Mm -hmm. They're good. It can still happen. Which touches on a question that I want to ask you, this, this amazing tradition that you were exposed to. Where, where are the places for training the next generation uh, the, 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 they're not in the universities, are well, they? Well, that's the problem. I mean, I think they might, no, they may not be any longer. Um, you know, there was a period in the 80s where a certain kind of traditional humanistic criticism gave way first to certain kinds of literary theory and then to certain, um, what's called them, sociological approaches having to do with race, class, and gender, and so on. Things were intensely politicized and so on. Um, I think that battle has been fought and largely won. Um, I'm not that worried about that anymore. Um, I think that the problem is that in part owing to the technology, but not only, young people now are taught mainly to game things, uh, hmm. to game their courses, to game their grades, to game their applications. So, so it's it, economism. It's economism. economism. It's this, this thing that they're taught to worship, which is pragmatism. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a philosophy and as a view of life, I don't like pragmatism. As my, as my old friend and teacher, Sidney Morgenbesser, once said, the only problem with pragmatism is that it doesn't work. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I, think, I don't believe in it. Um, and I think that everything, the, the smartest question you can ask in America right now that young people are taught to ask is not whether something is true or false or good or bad or, or ugly or beautiful, but how does it work? How does it work? That's all anybody wants to know. How does it work? And the really smart thing you could say is, no, it doesn't work that way. This is how it really works. That's mm -hmm. the esoteric knowledge that, that establishes you. Is, um, and 
obviously at a certain level one has to know how things work, but how things work is not the reason to live. It's not the reason to write. It's not the reason to have a family. It's not the reason to have a community. It's not the reason to have a country. We don't, <coughs> we don't have these things because of how things work. We have them because we hold certain ideals or values or beliefs that we have to remember how to defend. Um, so, yeah, I worry about these things. Mm -hmm. I worry about these things. How, how would you advise students to prepare for the future then in, the, in this kind Yeah. Well, um, right now it's a tricky question because of the recession and people worried about jobs and making a living, and I understand that. An old friend of mine many years ago once said that the reason so many intellectuals could come up during the depressions is because everybody was broke. It didn't, you know, <laughs> didn't matter if you were the broke one because the bankers were broke too. Um, so there is, I understand, I understand the anxiety. Um, but I do think that society gives young people four years in their lives in which they can read and think. Only four years. I keep telling young people this. Um, when, I hear, when I meet young people who are accelerating college, I tell them they're mad. They're absolutely mm. mad. They'll never get it back. Um, and I think that uh, I'm one of those, um, I hold out for the humanities. I think that, that people in college should be force-fed the humanities if necessary um, because whatever they retain is going to affect them in the deepest ways. Uh, and they'll figure out how things work. Mm -hmm. They'll get there. I mean, everybody's going there. They'll figure it out. You know, we're not, this society is not suffering from a surfeit of people with their heads in the clouds. That's not the problem. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we have young people who are cold-blooded realists at preternaturally early ages. Um, so we're not suffering from too many idealists or too many poets or too many. I mean, that's not the problem mm -hmm. we face. Um, and I think the college should offer a certain resistance to the practical frame of mind. Now, it's hard. I see this. Uh, I have a nephew at Columbia right now, and I hear stories from him. It's hard. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard. Everything needs to be gamed. Everything needs to be gamed. Um, you, you talk about the, the end state of perfection, but more important is the capability to become more perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, perfect, you know, it's funny. It's the distinction between perfection and perfectibility. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, uh, there is a 16th century Jewish thinker who wrote in an essay on frivolity, something that's always meant a great deal to me. He wrote that, he said that, that human beings are the creatures who are in their nature, in their definition, perfectible, who aspire to perfection. And he pointed out that in, if that is the defining characteristic of the human, then in such a creature, in a creature whose essence, whose essence is to aspire to perfection, perfection itself would be regarded as a flaw. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what we're, we're not supposed to be mm. perfect. We're supposed to be aspiring to perfection. Mm. And that dis a, a great deal of wisdom can be found in that distinction. A great deal. You know, people who believe they're perfect are always wrong. Uh, the, our current president is an example of this. <laughs> but people who aspire to perfection accomplish extraordinary things. Because they, and they do it because the aspiration to perfection somehow manages to bring the ideal and the critical frame of mind together, to yoke them together. And one doesn't fall away from the other. And that's the key. That's the key. So that's the distinction that I would make. Well, on, the, on that uh, positive note, actually, Leon, I'd like to thank you very much yeah, for coming pleasure. on our program. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.